Tenakoto Katoa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gary Wilson, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research here at the University of Waikato. And uh, tonight, we're here to celebrate the achievements of one of our leading academics and their promotion to professor. And I have the privilege of introducing them and providing some biographical details before we hear from him. So I hope you're comfortable. It's a long list of achievements. <laughs> so, t so tonight, I wish to introduce you to someone whose passion for economics and whose dedication to teaching and research is truly inspiring. Professor Michael Cameron is a dynamic figure in the university's Waikato Management School. He wears many hats, including an academic one tonight. An economist, a research associate at Tanaira, the Institute for Population Research, and as director of teaching and learning for the School of Accounting, Finance and Economics. He's also the author of somewhat controversially named blog, Sex, Drugs and Economics. I'll let you join the dots. Professor Cameron's journey into academia began humbly as a tutor back in 2002, and since then he's ascended the ranks from teaching fellow to senior lecturer to professor. He's highly regarded by his students and peers, having received six awards from the university for his outstanding teaching. In 2014, he was nominated for a National Tertiary Teaching Excellence Award, a testament to his commitment to education. Beyond the classroom, Professor Cameron's research ventures are nothing short of fascinating. For his PhD thesis, he chose to examine the relationships between poverty and HIV AIDS in rural Thailand. Since then, he's explored diverse economic terrains across a breadth of topics, from studying migration trends and population projections through to measuring the impacts of poverty on well-being. Professor Cameron's work is always relevant and of international significance. For example, he's examined the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on higher education students and investigated whether social media has the power to predict election results. I'm interested to find the answer to that. In recent years, Professor Cameron has sought to shed light on New Zealand's alcohol culture by investigating the complex relationship between the location of alcohol outlets liquor prices, people's drinking habits, and associated crime rates. His intellectual pursuits have taken him far and wide, with his research work based on collaborations from Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia through to India and China. He has been a visiting research associate at the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling at the University of Canberra, and in 2015 he was a visiting fellow at the programme on the global demography of ageing at Harvard University. A true leader in his field, Professor Cameron holds a number of key positions in prof professional associations and scholarly journals, shaping the discourse on regional studies and economic surveys. He is Vice President of the Population Association of New Zealand and Vice President New Zealand of the Australia New Zealand Regional Science Association International. In addition, He's managing editor of the Australasian Journal of, Re of Region Regional Studies, and he was appointed a member of the Social Sciences Panel of the Royal Society New Zealand Te Aparangi Marsden Fund for 2022 and 2024. I have no idea how he fits all that in. So without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome and a round of applause and welcome Professor Michael Cameron to the stage. Koto Katoa. Uh, ko Taihara te maunga, ko Waitaha Nui te awa, uh, ko Taupo te moana, uh, ko Cameron, me Anderson, me Patterson, me Hodson, uh, toku Fano, uh, ko Michael Cameron, toku ingoa, Ko te hunga mate, ki te hunga mate. 
ko te hunga ora, ki te hunga ora, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina tato katoa. Good evening, welcome uh, to my professorial lecture. Uh, Professor Wilson, tina koe, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. I will do my best to live up to it. Um, we'll see how I go. Um, I've been to a number of these uh, lectures um, and the brief that we're given is uh, to talk a little bit about our journey, journey um, and to talk a little bit about our research and I'm going to try and do both of those things. Um, and so I have been to a number of these lectures before and a lot of people talk, talk about their journey by presenting a bunch of photos of, of them growing up. Uh, I'm going to do that but I'm only going to rely on one photo. And the reason I'm only going to rely on one photo is because I think it captures uh, something important, but also uh, I think it's probably my peak prowess when it comes to uh, being photogenic, uh, because it didn't, it didn't get any better than this, and, uh, uh, and certainly I've never looked that good since. Um, and when, when we look back on our uh, photos when we were young, uh, it's tempting to think about, you know, where did, where did the years go? I look at this photo and I think, where did the hair go? Um, <laughs> but uh, the other thing, thinking about uh, photos of when we were young, uh, is that it reminds us um, of just the, the possibilities that we had when we were young. And um, there were so many things we could do. Uh, there were so many paths we could follow. Uh, there were so many questions to ask uh, and to answer. And... Uh, Maybe a few too many questions. Um, Mum will probably uh, attest to that. Um, so there were many things that I could do, and I wanted to do many things. Probably I wanted to do too many things, and, and uh, you've heard a little bit about what I've done. But, but let's go back to um, when I was in sixth form. Uh, for those of a more recent vintage, that would be year 12. Um, and so I had to... This was the first time I really got a chance to decide what I wanted to do. I got to choose what subjects we would study. And so uh, in my timetable there was space for seven subjects. So I chose seven subjects and, uh, and went along to uh, the uh, sixth form dean to get my uh, program of study signed off. Uh, and the response was no. No, you can't do that. And I was like, why? I can fit them all in. No, you can only do six. You can't do seven, you can't, can only do six. The seventh space is for your study period. And so after a, a little bit of agonizing, because I had to somehow get seven down to six, I, uh, I de decided which one I would drop. So I kept uh, seventh form calculus uh, and uh, English, because it was required. Um, that may have been a mistake. Um, uh, physics, chemistry, uh, German, accounting, and the seventh subject that I dropped was economics. <laughs> Which, kind of ironic, uh, given where I ended up. Um, so, uh, finished uh, school, uh, and like uh, any good uh, middle class uh, citizen, headed off to university with literally no idea what I was doing, uh, no idea what I wanted to do, uh, possibly too many things that I could have done, um, and started that first year in university in science, uh, studying physics and maths, and uh, it was a complete disaster. Um, I think because I didn't really know what I was doing, but also there were so many other things that suddenly caught my attention, uh, and so many other things that I wanted to do with my time, and somehow university ended up at the bottom of that list. Um, Somehow I managed to scrape through that first year with passing enough subjects that they would let me into the second year. Um, and even better, they let me completely pivot in my second year and I dropped physics and uh, maths and picked up chemistry and material science. Um, and that went even worse for me um, because uh, I used my student loan, as many of my peers did, to buy a car. Um, <laughs> Not allowed to do that anymore, but at the time, student loans were new and they hadn't cottoned on to the fact that we would, we would do stuff like buy a car. Um, but that meant that I could do all these other things that I, that I hadn't been able to do before, and, and that just diverted my attention. And so uh, by Easter of my second year, I had dropped out of university effectively. Um, and uh, 
uh, gone off to find myself. And usually when people are telling their story about how they went off to find themselves, they'll talk about backpacking in Uzbekistan or something, or building schools or health centres in some remote village in Malawi or something. Um, I made it as far as Tauranga um, <laughs> and um, didn't really go much further than that, but I did manage to do a lot of things um, after I left university. So I worked in hospitality, worked at a bar, um, worked at McDonald's for a while, um, started my own business as an internet consultant because the internet was new and nobody else knew that I didn't know anything more than they did. Um, <laughs> Found myself eventually uh, working at an accounting firm um, and worked my way up until I was managing that firm. Um, and that sounds really grandiose, um, but the firm had four people, so it wasn't, it wasn't that big a deal. But I was the only one there who didn't have an accounting degree. And so I thought, you know, this, this isn't a good look. I, I need to be a little bit more credible if I'm going to take over this business and buy it off my, my boss, who was already semi-retired by that stage. And so I went to night school at the Bay of Plenty Polytech, and intending to study accounting. And the first two papers that I did at Polytech were commercial law, and that, that wasn't great, but the second one I did was economics. Um, and uh, Kim Watson uh, at the Polytech did such a great job, I actually realised that this was kind of fun. This was something that I'd been kind of missing, and it had taken me eight years after sixth form where I dropped economics and not been able to do it to figure out that actually this was something which would let me answer some questions. Answer some questions that were interesting and important for me. So, um, so having started at night school and I was going to do uh, the uh, New Zealand Diploma in Business part time, uh, I decided that I wanted to go full time study. Third, second time around I guess at university, third, third subject choice. Um, and uh, finished my diploma in business at the Bay Polytech and then came over here to do my third and fourth year of the Bachelor of Management Studies, uh, intending to do economics and strategic management. Uh, strategic management didn't last the rest of that year and eventually I ended up just, just doing economics. And um, there are certain people to blame for that. One sitting in the front row, John, John Gibson, um, his third year paper in development economics uh, really opened my eyes uh, to a lot of the questions that economics could answer. Uh, Stephen Lim, uh, who didn't actually teach me, but uh, he was, uh, I was tutoring uh, for the papers that he was teaching, uh, also similarly uh, opened my eyes to the sorts of questions that economics could answer, and actually Stephen and John ended up being my PhD supervisors. So, uh, Never escaped uh, Waikato, stayed here uh, right through my, the rest of my undergrad, through my PhD, uh, and into uh, an academic role. Eventually getting to, uh, to be professor uh, last year. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about my research. So I thought, I thought a good way to introduce that would be uh, to steal from uh, the, the university has to go through this research assessment exercise every six years, the PBRF, the Performance Based Research Fund. And as part of that, uh, the academics have to develop evidence portfolios showing what our research excellence is. And part of that portfolio process is to uh, develop a con contextual summary of, uh, of what our research is. Basically, uh, who we are as a researcher, what we've been doing, what our research is about, encapsulate it all within 1,500 characters. So, um, Professor Wilson is going to avert his eyes and cover his ears right now because I'm going to tell you uh, what my current draft for the contextual summary is. It is, uh, my platform of research is really a bunch of things I thought would be kind of interesting to study. Um, you can see I still haven't really decided, you know, what I'm doing. I'm going to do a bit of everything. Um, but it's not quite that bad. I, I can actually sort of uh, uh, summarise my research into, into three coherent themes. Um, the first is uh, on population change, migration and population ageing. Um, the second is on the social impacts of alcohol and realistic policy responses. And the third is on uh, economics, education and teaching. And so thinking about those three things, uh, population change, you've got sex, uh, social impacts of alcohol, you've got drugs, uh, economics teaching about economics. There's my blog name, Sex, Drugs and Economics. 
All right, so uh, why, am I, why am I talking about alcohol today? I had to choose one of those three. I could have easily done 40 minutes on any of them, but alcohol seems to have brought the audience in, so it probably was a good choice. Um, alcohol is a bit of a paradoxical product. Um, it's a legal intoxicant, but at the same time, it's incredibly harmful. Uh, it's fun in low doses, but, uh, but dangerous when taken to excess. Um, and it's a huge contributor to family violence and harm within the home, and yet, at the same time, it's intimately linked to family events and, so, and special occasions. So alcohol is both positive and negative at the same time. Um, and in fact, that's kind of well captured by um, this artwork, which is uh, by William Hogarth, comes from the 1750s, uh, called Bear Street and Gin Lane. And Bear Street on the left, um, the inhabitants are happy and healthy and prosperous. Uh, they're drinking uh, English beer, small beer and ale. Um, and on the right, you've got Gin Lane, uh, where the inhabitants are miserable and addicted and poor, um, and they're drinking the foreign imported spirits. Um, and so we can think about alcohol as always being this sort of uh, seen both in a positive and negative light. And I could, go, I could spend a lot of time talking about the history of alcohol, and I could spend a lot of time talking about the history of alcohol policy in New Zealand, but I want to fast forward to 1989 because that was probably the most consequential change. Uh, the sale of Liquor Act uh, in 1989 uh, greatly liberalised alcohol sales in New Zealand. Uh, as a result, there was a big increase in the number of licences. Uh, so, for example, in Monaco City in South Auckland, um, between 1990 and 2008, uh, the number of licences more than tripled, um, increased from about 150 to nearly 500. And so we ended up with a situation that looks like this. Um, so this is uh, the Waimontli uh, Shopping Centre in Otara. Um, if you know Otara at all, this is just off Beards Road. Uh, Beards Road is the main road that runs from uh, Papatoetoe uh, over the uh, southern motorway uh, and curves, uh, curves around into the Otara town centre. Um, so this is about 50, minutes, uh, 50 sorry, metres off that road uh, just after you cross the uh, southern motorway. Um, and you can see that there, on the left there's a superette which had a liquor licence. There's also a liquor store right next door, which also had a li uh, liquor license, obviously. Um, but that's not the end of the story, uh, because on Beards Road, uh, if you go out of Waimon Lee Street, turn right, and went acro back across the uh, southern motorway, uh, just on the right there, you'd find another liquor store, pretty much opposite the DB Brewery, actually, uh, that liquor store. Uh, if you turned left onto Beards Road, uh, and then uh, drive about 100 metres along, turn left again onto Gilbert Road, you'd find another liquor store. Uh, and if you drove back out onto Beards Road and into the Otoa Town Centre, you'd find three more. So in the space of about a kilometre along Beards Road and just the sort of offshoots from that, uh, you had six liquor stores. Um, and so this, this photo was taken in 2008. Um, there's fewer of those stores now, interestingly, but, but back then uh, there were a lot. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So why is this a problem? Well, I can tell you a little bit of theory um, to start off with. Um, this theory is uh, what we call availability theory. It comes from uh, alcohol epidemiology. And it's a way of theoretically linking uh, the number of outlets to, to harm, and that could be crime, it could be uh, disorder, it could be uh, health harms, and so on. When you have more outlets in an area, that lowers what we call the full cost of alcohol. The, the full cost has two components to it. One is the price, and the second component of the full cost is what it costs you to get the alcohol. So if you have to drive to the store and then drive home, that's part of the full cost of obtaining alcohol. Having more outlets actually lowers both of those components of the full cost. Uh, because if there's more outlets in an area, you don't have to travel as far. Right? So that second component is, uh, is reduced. And if you've got more outlets in an area, they should compete with each other, and one of the ways they compete is by lowering their prices. And so you end up with a lower full cost of alcohol. In fact, we think about competition usually as being a good thing. That's why we have the Commerce Commission to ensure competition, but actually it's lowering prices, and lowering prices of, is not necessarily good uh, for all products. 
Um, a lower full cost of alcohol, people drink more. When people drink more, there's more harm. So that's essentially a way of linking, theoretically, more outlets to more harm. And so that's where I picked things up. So in 2008, I got some uh, funding from the Alcohol Advisory Council, ALAC, uh, to look at uh, the location of outlets, what the outlets were doing, and importantly, whether there was some link to, to harm. And so uh, thinking about those sorts of questions, where do outlets locate? Um, this is uh, Monaco City. Um, it's not obvious from the map because I've extract, extracted it from the rest of the country. So um, let me give you a little bit of a geog geography lesson. Um, this is the international airport just here. This is Maungari. Uh, this is the Manukau town centre. Uh, this is Manurewa. Uh, this is Pakaranga, Hawick, Bucklands Beach. Um, this is, uh, if you know the, the eastern part of uh, Auckland outside of Manukau, well, this is Whitford here. This is uh, Beachlands, this is Moraitai, and this big rural area here is this, all the area around Clevedon. Right, this was all the, the old Monaco city before it was part of the, uh, the super city. So I'm going to use a map that looks like this a few times, so it pays to orient yourself. Um, so there's two things on this map. One is the different areas are different colours, right, and the darker the colour is, the more people are living there. The second thing is there's lots of little coloured dots. Each of those coloured dots is an alcohol outlet of, of a type, and the uh, different colours represent different types. And one of the things that's obvious to, to note here is that the outlets tend to locate where people are. Right? That's, that's no real surprise. There's a few sort of exceptions uh, out here. These are uh, vineyards out by Clevedon. So, um, but for the most part, uh, outlets are, tend to be located where people are. Um, more interestingly, though, uh, is when we look at uh, the relationship between outlets lo location and social deprivation. So the darker areas here on this map represent areas that are higher in social deprivation, if you like, they're the poorer areas, the lower socioeconomic areas. Um, and now you can start to see a little bit more of a pattern. Um, so there's fewer outlets out here. This is rural as well as being wealthy, but even up here there's few. Um, but there is many down here in this arc that goes from uh, Maungari through to Manurewa, uh, the lower socioeconomic part of South Auckland. Now the question is, does it matter, right? Does it matter for harm? Is there a relationship between where outlets locate and the harms that they create? So um, I want to fast forward to a slightly different project which was not focused on South Auckland but looked at uh, similar data uh, for the whole of the North Island. And so in this research we found uh, that uh, bars and nightclubs generate a lot of harm. So this is, this, uh, these columns here represent the relationship between outlets of different types and violence in the North Island. So but an additional bar or nightclub in a neighbourhood was associated with about five additional uh, violent harm uh, incidents per year. Uh, significantly more than the other uh, outlet types and yet all of them were associated in some way. Uh, with more violence. Uh, similar story if we looked at property damage, again, bars and nightclubs uh, were associated with a lot more property damage, about three additional property damage events in, in the neighbourhood uh, per year. And that might not sound like a lot, but you've got to remember how many bars and nightclubs there are in the North Island. Right, there are hundreds. Right, so this is representing thousands of additional uh, property damage events, thousands of additional violence events per year. All right, now I know there's at least some of my first year students here and they'll be thinking, you know, this is correlation, this is not causation. And, and they're right, it's not that simple, right? There's a good reason why um, we, we can't necessarily uh, pin this down as easily as just looking at where's the harm happening, where's the outlets happening. Because we're making an assumption here, which is the assumption that the causality runs from more outlets to more crime. And I've given you a theoretical story as to why that might be from availability theory. But actually, things could work in the other direction, right? We could tell a plausible story about why areas with more crime might have more outlets. Because areas that have more crime tend to have lower property rents, including lower commercial property rents. Uh, that makes them an attractive location for you to locate if you're trying to set up a retail store, because it's going to be cheaper 
uh, in terms of rents uh, for you to be there. So actually, more crime might actually lead to more outlets. Or could be something else that's creating more out, both more outlets and more crime. Uh, as an example of that, uh, social cohesion or social capital, right? Areas that have more social cohesion, more social capital, they're better able to prevent crime in the location, so they tend to have lower crime, but they're also more likely to uh, be able to coordinate and prevent alcohol outlets from opening in their neighbourhood. And so we'd end up in a situation where we see more outlets in particular areas and more crime there, and it's simply because those areas have lower social cohesion. So we can deal with some of these problems uh, as to which way is the causality going, uh, but not others. So in terms of social cohesion as a story, if we control for deprivation, if we control for the demographics of the area, and a few other things, we can at least try and exclude the, mo the main uh, problems there. Uh, the one that I want to focus on next is, is it more crime leading to more outlets? Because if that, was, if that story was true, then we'd see more outlets not just well, we'd see this relationship between crime and outlets, not just for alcohol outlets, but for outlets of all types. So I had a research assistant about 10 years ago um, go throughout Hamilton and uh, determine the location of all of the bakeries, hairdressers, service stations, and takeaway food outlets uh, in the city. And, and this sounds like this should be a really trivial thing to do, you just look on the internet, but actually it, it's not that easy, and in 2014, it was, definitely wasn't that easy. She literally had to visit every single business zone in the city and walk or drive through it, noting down where all these locations were. Um, but that was pretty important data because it allowed me to look at what's the relationship between all of these other outlet types as well as alcohol outlet types and uh, violent crime for Hamilton. Um, and we actually find that if we do the same sort of... Um, statistical relationship between, uh, between violence and outlets of different types, actually service stations that are the worst, um, and bakeries are pretty bad as well, off licenses, licensed clubs, which is sports clubs, uh, citizens clubs, uh, RSAs and so on. Um, but the reason why I did this is I wanted to work out, is it retail density that's really picking this up? So. So taking this, these results, extracting how much of the harm we could actually um, explain by the location of bakeries, hairdressers, service stations, and takeaway food outlets, if we could strip all that away, there should be no relationship left with the other outlets, or a very small relationship, and in fact, that wasn't true at all. So it's not a story of retail density, right, that's explaining uh, the relationship between alcohol outlets and violence. It's actually something else that's going on. It's not just a story about where they locate. All right, but uh, the outlets that seem to be the, the worst here were the licensed clubs and the off-licenses. So we've done a little bit of work over the years looking at what it is that off-licenses do. Uh, so we're back to Monaco City now. This is, uh, for many years I've been collecting data on the prices and trading hours of alcohol outlets uh, every January. Uh, we try and do a little phone survey of outlets in Hamilton and South Auckland. Uh, we're not very successful with the phone, so we end up uh, visiting many of them. So um, over the course of a week, I think I visit nearly 200 liquor stores and supermarkets uh, every January, uh, collecting what are their closing, opening and closing times uh, and the prices of certain products. Um, and so this is the data from 2012 uh, for the old Monaco City area, and what you'll notice is that uh, the lighter areas are uh, where the off-licenses close earlier uh, on, Saturday, on Friday and Saturday night, uh, and the areas that are darker, they close later. And you might remember uh, one of the earlier maps I showed you um, that showed you the socioeconomic deprivation, social deprivation of these areas. The areas where the stores open later on Friday and Saturday night tend to be the areas that are more deprived, right, lower socioeconomic areas. Uh, when we look at pricing, though, it's not quite that simple. Um, in general, prices do tend to be a little bit lower in areas that are uh, more deprived, but actually it's not quite as straightforward as it is uh, for the opening hours. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about pricing uh, a little bit later. Because I want to switch to something else. Um, I like doing field work. I like getting out of the office. Uh, most people think about economists sitting in the office, sort of tapping away at our computers, looking at data on the screens or something. Nah, I'm going to go out and talk to people. So um, in 2014, uh, the government decided to change uh, the uh, limit for drink driving. Do you remember this? So this was back in 2014. And at the time, I, I looked at this change and went, you know what, that's, that's a kind of a, it's an interesting change. It's one that, that we should support. But at the same time, I bet nobody knows. Nobody who's drinking knows whether they're over the old limit, let alone the new limit. Um, I bet if I took a breathalyzer and I went out and breathalyzed people in the street um, and asked them to guess what their breath alcohol content was, they would have no idea. Um, and then somebody gave me money to do this. Uh, so I bought a breathalyzer, uh, went out on the street and started surveying people in downtown Hamilton. Um, and we've done this twice now, we did it in 2014, we did it again in 2019. Um, in 2014, what we were really interested in was that question of, did pe were people able to guess uh, their breath alcohol content? So each one of the dots here represents somebody's guess, um, graphed against what their actual breath alcohol content was. Uh, the solid line going up at 45 degree line, if everybody guessed correctly, all of those dots would be exactly on that solid line. And so you can see that this is, looks pretty random. People have no idea, no idea at all. Um, they're better than completely at random uh, because the dashed line is the trend line that goes through all of these dots. So at least uh, on average, uh, people who were more, more intoxicated tended uh, to uh, guess that they were. Um, and yet, people who uh, were less intoxicated were more likely to overestimate, um, and people who were more intoxicated were more likely to underestimate. And so um, that was kind of interesting, but also I think a lot of people, and, and we were talking to people, a lot of people said they weren't driving anyway, right? so it didn't really matter. Um, but I guess if you wanted people to know whether they were safe to drive, you'd want to be confident that they could actually evaluate whether they were safe to drive or not. And this suggests that actually people can't do that at all. And so the safest thing for, for most people is to follow the advice that if you're drinking, don't drive. Because you actually have no idea um, how drunk you really are. Um, the other thing that this allowed us to do, and I want to fast forward to the 2019 uh, field work we did, was it allows us to measure how intoxicated are people on the street uh, over the course of the night, uh, because we were doing these surveys and we started at about 8 or 9 p.m. and we went until about 2 a.m. and so we could work out what's the average intoxication level of people we surveyed as we go through the night. And so this is what we get when we uh, look at that. Each one of these dots is uh, an average within a 10 minute period. Uh, the dashed line here is uh, averaging over uh, 50 minutes, so just under an hour. And what we see is the, the dinner crowd uh, up until about 10 uh, p.m. Uh, their level there is about 150. Uh, just for context, 250 is the new uh, limit for driving. Uh, 400 was the old limit. Um, then from about 10 till about 11, things start to ramp up a little bit, people are a bit more intoxicated. After that, it flattens out, but it's still growing. So over the course of the night, the people that we're seeing on the street are more and, and more and more intoxicated, but most of that change happens by about 11 p.m. Right? After that, it's not getting much worse. Um, but also, this allowed us to look at, well, what is driving this? Right? And one of the key things that we were looking at in this 2019 study uh, was what was the role of pre-drinking? Pre-drinking is people who drink before they go out. Right? And so comparing people who pre-drink with those who don't, I don't think there's any real surprise here um, that the pre-drinkers are more intoxicated than those, than those who started drinking after they, after they came out. Um, but what's surprising is that um, the pre-drinkers are pretty drunk all the way through the night, even, even as early as 9 p.m., even as early as 9.30. Um, and in fact, if we look at the difference, the average difference between the people who are pre-drinking and the people who are not, the average difference is about 250 uh, micrograms per litre, which is 
the drink driving limit. Um, so that's the difference between people who are pre-drinking and those who are not. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, what I was interested in was realistic policy um, for this. And so a lot of people, uh, a lot of policy makers jump on this pre-drinking and, uh, and of course pre-drinking is people buying it off licenses, often drinking at home and then going into town. So maybe we should do something with the off licenses by such as making them close earlier. So we actually had asked people um, who were pre-drinking when did you buy your alcohol that you, that you were pre-drinking that night? And it turns out that most of them buy uh, before 7 p.m. Two-thirds of them buy before 7 p.m. So if you wanted to use the off-license out trading hours as a way of restricting pre-drinking, you'd have to have supermarkets and off-licenses stopping alcohol sales very early in the day, right? well before 7 p.m., which doesn't seem like a realistic uh, thing to do. Um, but one of the things, one of the other things we asked about was why do you pre-drink? And, and again, this is something that's unsurprising once you, once you think about the results. A lot of people talked about social motivations, they wanted to get primed for the night, get ready, feel a little bit buzzed before they go out. Okay, that's fine, I remember those days too. Um, but the other uh, motivation was economic. Um, it was simply way cheaper to buy alcohol from the off-licenses from supermarkets than it is to buy from bars. And actually, that's something that the government had, had done because when the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act came in in 2012, one of the things they cracked down on was happy hours. And happy hours actually made the differential in pricing between off-licenses and bars much greater. And so rather than people going out early to a bar and drinking during the happy hour, they stayed home and drank at home instead. Right? And so uh, that's why we've seen a rise in pre-drinking. Uh, fast forward a little bit, not too far on from, from 2019, COVID changed everything. And that, that applies to many things, uh, but also uh, applies to the way that people buy alcohol. Uh, because while there was alcohol delivery um, prior to COVID, uh, COVID just doubled down on this. Um, so home delivery of alcohol suddenly became something that everybody was doing, right, rather than being uh, a niche uh, service. Uh, the problem with home delivery is that uh, controls on alcohol delivery are much laxer than controls on sales in store. Uh, why? Because if you buy alcohol online, um, nobody's really checking your ID. All you need to do is click the button that says I'm 18 and over, job done. Um, so we were interested though in what happens at the delivery end. Right at the sales end, it's obvious that anybody who's under 18 can just click the button and then buy. The question is what happens when it's actually delivered to them. Um, so again, out in the field, uh, we, uh, we bought some alcohol, we got it delivered to us, and we were checking whether, uh, firstly we were checking uh, what was it costing us to do this. We were checking how many different places would be willing to uh, deliver to us same day. And um, we were checking would they check ID? Would they drop things on the doorstep and run without even knowing if somebody was home? Uh, because of course these would be uh, a real problem. And so we did this in Hamilton in South Auckland. Um, hired ourselves some Airbnbs, got some alcohol delivered. In fact, we ended up with a lot of alcohol. Um, <laughs> you think this looks like a lot, but actually, by the time we took this photo, we'd already disposed of about half of it. So, so um, and uh, my son's room got turned into a sort of an impromptu uh, alcohol storehouse. Um, what did we find? Well, we could get a lot of alcohol delivered. Uh, we could get it delivered quickly. Some places would deliver in under an hour. Um, but actually, this research may have been the least cost-effective research that I've ever done because we had a couple of Airbnbs in a couple of locations in Hamilton and then in South Auckland. But in each one of those locations, we could only get a handful of places to even sell us alcohol and deliver it the same day. Um, so myself and two research assistants in the Airbnb waiting uh, a few hours for alcohol to be delivered and we'd only get sort of five or six in a day. Um, so incredibly costly um, as far as research goes. Um, and the price was quite high. 
Uh, and that was what surprised me the most about this, I guess, because uh, we had in mind beforehand that you could get alcohol delivered quickly and cheaply. But actually, that wasn't the case. Um, and having talked to a few uh, store owners subsequent to this, uh, it's become clear why. People are just not willing to pay the high premium that it would cost for fast delivery, for the most part. And so a lot of stores that during COVID started doing deliveries, then as we came out of lockdown, they stopped because nobody was willing to pay them the real cost of having uh, one of their um, staff members actually deliver the alcohol. Um, in terms of ID checking, uh, we were also surprised with the results. We expected the supermarkets to be fully on top of this. Turns out the supermarkets were the worst offenders. Um, they were the least likely to check ID and the most likely to drop your delivery on your doorstep and leave before you got a chance to answer the door. So they had no idea whether they were selling, uh, whether they, sorry, were delivering alcohol to someone who was underage. Um, in contrast, we thought the delivery drivers like uh, Deliver Easy and Uber Eats would be the worst offenders. In fact, they were the best ones. Um, they always checked ID and they never left al alcohol unattended. Um, in fact, talking to uh, one of the Uber Eats drivers after we'd finished uh, this research, um, they actually have to f take a photo of people's ID before they're allowed to leave the alcohol, which is a pretty effective uh, means of ensuring that they know that the alcohol is being delivered to someone uh, who is of the right age. Okay, so um, that's a sampling of some of my research uh, in alcohol. Um, there are other things I've done as well. I evaluated the one-way door policy uh, that the bars in Whangarei have, and uh, uh, long story short, it didn't have much effect at all, sadly. Um, and there's other things as well. Um, but still not done, still lots of questions. I still have lots of questions. I'm gonna continue to have lots of questions and I'm gonna continue to explore them, uh, as you might expect, uh, given the other things that I've said today. Um, in particular, I still don't think we've nailed down this uh, causality. Uh, I'm still not happy with it. Uh, maybe it still does go from more crime to more outlets rather than the other way around. Um, and there's a lot more that we can do in terms of understanding the pricing, understanding the trading hours, understanding the way that competition affects these things. And so I've got a lot of data on this. Um, and uh, I've also just been granted access to a pretty um, substantial data set on pricing at the store level weekly going back about a decade. Um, so uh, there's a lot more that I can do with this. All right, how are we going for time? Perfect. All right, I need to, uh, to acknowledge some people before I finish. Uh, I'm gonna acknowledge uh, Colleen and Roger, uh, my parents. They started, started me on this journey because they uh, didn't uh, tell me I wasn't allowed to ask questions, and so that's where I started. Um, or at least I don't remember them telling me not to ask questions. They probably did many times and I just didn't listen. Um, uh, my wife, Gemma. Um, again, lets me ask lots of questions. Gets angry with me because I ask too many questions, um, but uh, nevertheless lets me do so. Uh, Sarah and Ryan, who, yeah, they also get bombarded with questions as well. They just don't answer them. Um, the research has been funded uh, to Fatuora Health New Zealand's my latest funder, but before that it was the Health Promotion Agency, the Alcohol Advisory Council, uh, the University of Waikato Strategic Research Fund. They were the ones who let me buy the breathalyzer. Um, that was kind of awesome. Um, and then a whole bunch of co-authors that I've worked with over the years. This is not an exhaustive list. These are the ones I've worked with the most. Uh, many different universities in New Zealand uh, and Australia. And then a small army of research assistants who have helped with all sorts of things from geocoding the location of, of liquor outlets by hand, uh, doing field work, helping with some of the uh, analysis uh, and so on. All right. So that is me, Amihi Nui Kiakoto Katoa. Thank you very much. Tenakoto Katoa. 
My name is Frank Scrimger, and it's my pleasure to uh, bring this evening to a conclusion. Michael, thank you very much for your address. Uh, it's, uh, it was really great to uh, hear some, something of your life story, even if you uh, restricted the photos. Um, and it is encouraging to us all to see we're asking questions and our childhood can take us over the long run. Um, I trust that uh, we as a community invest more and more in encouraging uh, future university students in their early years. Michael, I noticed your acknowledgement of uh, Stephen Lim and John Gibson, and uh, I think uh, your talk tonight uh, showed how you are a worthy participant in the line of uh, successful economics professors and analysts and teachers at this university. There's been a long tradition since John Ward, one of the four founding professors of the university, and it's great to see uh, you joining uh, uh, the pro professoriate um, uh, and along with uh, Professor Anna Strutt in recent times. Thank you for um, opening up to us how economists go about their daily work. Sometimes uh, in the community we hear uh, people talk as if they assume that economists know the answer to everything before they've uh, done any work. But you clearly showed how it is so important to um, address competing hypotheses and to explore what is happening and why it's happening. And, and so it was great also to see your connection with other disciplines, whether it be uh, sociology or epidemiology or geography, whatever. Um, the world is a complicated place and none of us can um, claim uh, all the expertise that is needed to address the issues of, important, of importance. Many people these days talk about evidence-based evidence -based policies. If we are to have evidence-based policies, we need someone doing the dirty work to gather the data and to analyze it appropriately. Thank you for giving us some examples of uh, contemporary empirical work. I'd like to echo Professor Wilson's uh, words at the start of the night to honour you, Michael, for your contributions across uh, multiple areas of university and community life. And I'm sure the audience will appreciate there's a reason why we ask Michael to teach first year economics classes and try and uh, attract students to engage seriously with the discipline and potentially become economists themselves. I would like to thank everyone for attending tonight, visitors to the university, colleagues, staff members, students. And I trust that tonight's uh, experience encourages you to come back for the next professorial lecture, which will soon be announced. Watch out for that. So before I formally close, I would like to advise you that uh, Michael will stay around in the foyer for a little while afterwards. Feel free to uh, buttonhole him and uh, ask him some questions. He has so much fun asking questions for everyone else. Uh, now's the time for you to return the favour. Thank you very much for your attendance. Good night. <laughs>